Welcome back to the Unanimous Decision Podcast. I am your host, D-Palm. Follow me on Twitter at D-Palm66. Follow the show on Twitter at UDPod. Follow the entire Intern Network at the Intern Network on Twitter. Uh, you found us, don't lose us. Subscribe in the iTunes store. Subscribe everywhere you get your podcasts. Absolutely free. And once you subscribe, you can do us a huge favor. Leave a five-star review. Five-star review, I know it seems simple, it seems easy, but it really helps us. It really helps us out, our visibility. And if you want to leave something to say about the show, I'll read that on the air. Five stars, whatever you write, I will read. I've read very mean things about the Falcons, very mean things about Georgia, and um, I'll continue to do so at my own cosmic uh, karmic cost. You have more you want to say to this show, that's great. You can always shoot us an email at udpodcast at gmail.com. We take all the emails uh, and uh, we'll read them on the air. Or if it's something like, hey, you want a topic you want brought up or something you want to, to pitch to the show, we can do that too. We had, did have a new email I'm going to read later on. Uh, I think that's all the like kind of business I want to do because I've got on the air today a real live professional broadcaster, my man Sam Franco. What up, Sam? Daniel, how are you this uh, fine? I guess it's a Sunday that we're recording this, but uh, in general, how have you been uh, in, in recent history, other than the fact that uh, our teams continue to stab knives in our backs and uh, and just kick us while we're constantly down? Well, I'll tell you what, and it's something that occurred to me this morning. I'm sports impervious until August. That's a good point. Nothing can hurt me. Like, the Hawks are trash, fine. I'm I'm out on the Braves. Hey, you want to move to Cobb County? Cool. I live in Atlanta. That's fine. And so now I'm I can't be hurt by I'm I'm in sports now from here until about August for sheer enjoyment. That's a good point. I mean, and we get to be true neutrals until that point. Until you know Georgia fires back up. Until the uh, Falcons hit training camp and all that stuff. Yeah, I guess you're you're totally right. For now, we can just. Sit here and uh, cast judgment upon people. On people are <laughs> we can uh, we make fun of absolutely every bad thing that happens to every team that isn't us because we won't care. Exactly. We we have the. It's not moral high ground. It's moral um, atheism. We just don't care anymore. It's just <laughs> we're like, all right, whatever. We're, we're here to see the world burn. That's what we're here for. We've all got our agendas. Like I've got my very clear, well stated LeBron agenda. I'm not gonna ever back down from that. But my agenda is also backed up with facts. But like it, it's it's. It's so nice to because I have no like for the first time I think in I want to say about ten years maybe longer the Hawks are going to miss the playoffs. Yeah, I know. I know. It's crazy that they they finally hit hit that set button from being a team that kind of just fledged around the middle of the Eastern Conference. Now they're like, all right, we finally realize that we can't live on that island anymore. You either have to be really good in the NBA or really bad. If you're in the middle, you're just stuck there well, in, this, in this purgatory. I think that what the the the, bat, the the I guess paradoxically the worst thing that happened to them was the the season they won the East. The what? season because they think they were better than Well, they were. well not even think they're better than they were. I think that it gave the fans and, and energized the team a lot with a lot of hope. But what we didn't know at that time is that that was the, that was the peak. That was the highest it was going to get. And, and, and let's be real. A lot of teams would kill for a season like that. I'm not denigrating the accomplishments of that team. I'm just saying that our, our aspirations were, were bigger than they could provide. But it doesn't take away from the good things that they brought to the city because those were some fun years when we were running things in the East. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. It was uh, it was good times. Uh, the highlight factor. Well, I mentioned this on the uh, fallout show from the events of uh, that one Monday in the dome. But I, I got to run into you right before the game. I physically ran into you. Me and my father were going to our seats um, where they were, and we're walking through kind of the bowels of the stadium. And I see, well, that looks like a really well put together San Franco. Oh my God, that's San Franco. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was after I had uh, used a fire extinguisher to break into one of our company vehicles. <laughs> and I locked my keys in the car. I didn't think you were going to tell that story, but that's good. That's... <laughs> no, I've been given the okay. You know, okay, it's, fair it's, enough. It's, it's one of those things where, hey, I think it makes uh, the heartbreak that, that became uh, upon or that came upon us that night uh, that much more uh, heartbreaking or that much more, more funny, depending on where you stand. I love that the things people are allowing us to say in the name of content these days. Um, so we, we crossed past the tunnel. We said our hellos. Uh, we head to our respective areas to watch the game. How was your experience? Like, how was it? <clears throat> I've talked about it on here for me. It was kind of because I and, and, and not to stunt like I was very close to the action. So I was living and dying with every like 
breath. It was. I don't go to games often. I don't like crowds. I, I'm not fun to watch football with because I, I talk about things that no one cares about but me and like <laughs> seven other people in the world. Fortunately, when I was with Barso, when we were there, he's one of those people who watches football like I do. So we were we were annoying everyone around us, but we were fine. But how was the experience for you? Because, man, it it. It felt like a it felt like a home game. Like that stadium, they could tell you it was split. It was not. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was definitely a uh, Georgia heavy crowd. And uh, uh, you know, I guess because of the magnitude of the event, and uh, go when I first walk into the press box and I see like all these national writers that you know I follow on Twitter, follow Snapchat or Instagram, whatever. Uh, I know I see see people and, and they're and they're doing the same thing I do, which is covering the game. Uh, obviously, at a, at a much bigger scale for some of these guys. Uh, you know, being an SEC guy, I, I see guys like Mark Schlaib off me ESPN a lot, but, but when you're seeing the, the true national people, uh, when you're walking by, uh, you know, Todd McShay uh, on the sideline, I mean, you know, you just kind of get the gravity of, uh, of the moment, and, and it's it truly was a cool experience. They had, uh, because I'm, I'm radio, you know, they have radio and TV up in the auxiliary uh, press seating, which was, uh, if you looked up in the 300, there was all these rows of, like, white tables. And they basically took an entire, an entire shit out uh, for uh, for media to sit up there. So that's <clears> where I was. And I was actually on the front row of that. So I was on the front row of the upper deck decks and pretty much sideline. I'd say about 35, 40 yard line. So I had some phenomenal. That's a great shot. Uh, no question. I mean, I got to see uh, pretty much everything I needed to see from that game. And then, you know, media goes down on the field the last five Oh, minutes. Oh, I saw you. I saw you on the sideline. You were uh, right, I guess, like probably directly in front of me for a good uh, second half of the, the end of that game. Oh, wow. I, I, I did not notice that. But uh, the uh, the crazy thing is, you know, the ebbs and flows. You know, I'm standing right within maybe 20 feet of the kicker uh, that misses the kick for Alabama there to uh, – to give, to give your fans another glimmer of, of hope. And uh, obviously, when you're in a situation like that, it's, it's so rough to lose a game in that fashion. I, I truly feel what Oklahoma fans felt at the end of the Rose Bowl, uh, even to a bigger extent because this was the national championship game. But it was just such a weird irony or whatever you want to call it for me because I was standing in basically the same spot at the end of the Rose Bowl and Sony gallops right past me to win the game for Georgia. And then I'm the, no lie, the, almost the exact same spot when Alabama caught the touchdown. So I mean, it was a truly an incredible experience. And I mean, Georgia, Georgia played back to back two of the two of the better ball games, you know, I've ever seen in person. So uh, it's been a crazy year for Georgia, but for it to end like that just was a it was pretty tough. Yeah, SB Nation did a thing where they ran uh, their hundred best college football games of the year, and Georgia was the top two. And I said, doesn't help much. No, it but not, not your own voice, I mean, I and something is wrong with your audio recording like settings. Please check your microphone and microphone settings, today. or visit uh, Skype.com for more help. Thank you for using this. Mail and Rose Bowl and Tiki Blover finally came. So uh, uh, even a little, a little icing on the cake there. I, there I also, first time I was a, a Kroger. And, excuse me, I was in a Kroger in Atlanta on Friday night, and they had Georgia SEC championship car flags, and I bought one of those. I'm just trying to live the good moments to, to not necessarily reflect on the heartbreak, but this season has been so incredible. I mean, I got to go see Georgia win at Notre Dame. Uh, you know, the, the night before that game, thousands and thousands and thousands of Georgia fans flocked to Wrigley Field, and, you know, Finn's Dooley threw out the first pitch, and, and, the, and, like, around the sixth or seventh inning, we start calling the dogs at Wrigley Field. Like, what the <laughs> hell is going on here? Here That happened. George to get revenge on Auburn in the, Auburn in the championship. Oh, I skipped the part where we went down to Jacksonville and beat Florida's ass, uh, you know, uh, just to, to throw all that together. I mean, it was truly an incredible season for any Georgia fan, probably the best since uh, that uh, 1980 National Championship uh, win. I'll tell you what, man, and that's one thing I, I think can't get lost about this season, and it's easy to because, and you and I have talked about this off air, is the nationalization of college football where the regional things don't matter, particularly when our region is the forefront of the national game. But an SEC title matters. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, that's 100%. Uh, the season this team put together matters, and while, yes, it's, 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 it's not easy, it's seductive and logical to get lost in that heartbreak. It's 
I'm so happy for those kids who had such a great year and got to see so much reward for the hard work they've put in. And I still won the freaking Rose Bowl. Man. I mean, come on. Yeah. And I got to ask, what's the mood in the, in the Classic City now? Your boot's on the ground, brother. You're in Athens, Georgia. How is the, the, the local atmosphere in the wake of this? I mean, it was obviously pretty, pretty rough a couple of days, you know, you know, just but Georgia got so close, close, something they hadn't done, done, done since teenage, but it's, it, it's optimistic, or it's optimism about it. There's so much of that good feeling about the program, because you see Georgia got this far under Kirby Smart in only his second year in the program. He, he took what Coach Reek did in his second year, which was win an SEC championship, and took it that step further, right. almost getting a national championship trophy here in Athens, so... Uh, you look at the optimism that is just coming from the fan base and, and coming from the program and, and people that work at Georgia, just everybody is talking positively. There's no negativity like there was, say, in, in 2007 when Georgia stopped st- by in the Sugar Bowl bowl, and then went into 2008 as the uh, preseason number one team in the country. There was still going into that season a lot of kind of negativity and uh, or, or you know a lot of people not necessarily believing that Georgia should be that number one team. And we saw what happened uh, when Alabama came into Athens. And, uh, and smack Georgia around a little bit, uh, you know, in 2008. So uh, I just think that there's a different feel because of what Georgia's doing in recruiting. I mean, six five-star recruits right now, and they might not even be done. You know, we've got National Signing Day coming up where they could bring in some more. So there's just too much positive momentum. I'm telling people to dwell all on the, the bad loss or, or the loss that happened there in the SEC championship, or the national championship, which was kind of a de facto SEC championship. But just because... <laughs> I mean, there's there's so much optimism about where this program is going. I mean, what what Kirby Smart has done in recruiting is truly mind blowing. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a great quick turnaround there at Georgia, and uh, I couldn't be happier to see it. Other places are trying to make the same kind of turnaround, but they're making hires that don't necessarily make any sense. Lane Kiffin, who's signed a um, I'm gonna stay here forever, wink wink, nudge nudge, no I'm not deal with uh, Ford Atlantic this year. Recently hired a 24 year old offensive coordinator. You must say, my, he must have gone to the uh, the halls of Madden and pulled out one of the best Madden players, someone who's innovative and forward thinking, and said, nope, it's uh, Charlie Weiss's kid. Yeah, this was a bizarre one it, just because it has that ring to it where Coach Weiss, uh, as in uh, Charlie Weiss Sr., uh, is also you know this high-profile coach just like Lane Kiffin's dad and Monty Kiffin and the Tampa 2 and all that stuff. So it, it definitely has this not only this nepotism feel but also this kind of, Hey, you and I come from similar backgrounds, type thing going going. On. Well, not even just that. It's it's one thing about because Monty Kiffin has largely been successful, the architect of success everywhere he's been. Charlie Weiss is one of them Belichick dudes who, who left Belichick and made us ask a lot of questions about what kind of deficits had Belichick help hide. Like, it, it went poorly everywhere Charlie Weiss went, not just Notre Dame, not just Kansas. Also, didn't go great as OC at Florida. Like it's, he's not um, – this isn't exactly football royalty. And even funnier to me is who does Charlie Weiss Jr. replace on that staff? Kendall Bryles. Again, <laughs> and that's, that was a strange hire anyway uh, to see Kendall Bowles go there. And, and, and look, Kiffin isn't going to apologize for any decision he makes. He uh, definitely lets you know that based on his uh, choices of uh, uh, using uh, different dating apps uh, for different purposes, uh, maybe in the past, uh, hashtag Joey Freshwater. But, you know, <laughs> You just you just gotta you gotta look at the guy and he, and you gotta give him credit. I mean he he knows how he wants to run his program. He knows quite frankly how to use social media. I mean the the guy has done a terrific job and all this trolling he does of Alabama stuff. You know he, he he's not he's not a, not an idiot. I, I will say that say that in the past he's done some dumb things as a coach, but I think he's learned a lot and I think that you know after one more year at Florida Atlantic, I do think this will be his last season there. I think some team's going to get a heck of a coach and a guy that's learned a lot and knows what mistakes not to make anymore. I just think it's remarkably gets this many chances. I, I, I always think that. Um, but still, talent, talent, talent continues to get chances. I, I, I think that we've seen how impressive his offenses have been, and you're going to get a lot more chances if you can deliver the goods. 
We'll see. Uh, I think the biggest story here out of this is really the nepotism, which extended to the new hires in Carolina in the NFL. North Turner is the new offensive coordinator for the Panthers. Hope you guys survive the experience. Um, but not just North Turner's coming on board, because North Turner's son will be uh, serving as quarterback's coach. His brother, however, will be an offensive consultant, and his nephew will be the assistant quarterback's coach. The North Turner run quarterback room will have North Turner's son and North Turner's son's cousin as yeah. as, as quarterback coaches. Hey man, I'm very upset about that about mainly because it's the that's one less one less job that Greg Knapp could take. And yes, I'm talking about uh, Greg Knapp, the same guy that used to sit uh, next to Michael Vick with those overhead shots of uh, Michael Vick having a turnover or something, and Vick just looking at him like he was speaking Chinese. Uh, that's the guy that the Falcons are talking about hiring again. So mainly, I'm just upset that that's one less job that he could take. But yes, this nepotism that 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 takes nepotism to a whole. New it's such level. a weird place, right? It's just it, it, to have. I understand when a coach wants to bring on his son or something. But when you're bringing on on like three dudes, like <laughs> you're not bringing your son on as an offensive assistant. You're bringing your son on as quarterbacks coach. <laughs> oh right. I mean, you're you're just hand delivering these jobs to, to people and. Look, most of the time with nepotism, I don't blame the the son. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, exactly. Which was don't turn down like if someone offers you a job you're not qualified for, you take it. Well, like in my line of work, for example, Mike Golick Jr. has has forged his way into a pretty nice little career, uh, being uh, only 26, 27 years old. You know, hosting a national radio show and things like that. A lot of people want to bang on him, and it's like I'm not going to bang on him. I mean, what are you going to do? Not take the job? <laughs> if he fails, you bang on him. But, you know, yeah. as long as they're successful, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to... He, he got a shot. He, 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 can't, you can't, he, can't take, he can't take credit for genetics no more than we can blame him for them. Exactly, and that's the thing. I mean, all you have to do there is say, well, you know, if people are going to criticize, you just point out, well, would you have turned down the job? So, I mean, that's the thing. If you were in that situation, you'd probably have done the same thing. But when it, talk, when it comes to running an offense and running a football team... Yeah, that whole thing is definitely a lot. I don't know how necessarily that's even going to play. That's the thing. I mean, these players have to respect the coaches that they're working with. And when you think a, think a guy's got a job because daddy over there is your offensive coordinator, that might be a problem. That's what brings up the point that Charlie Weiss Jr. is 24. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a serious turn here because, for my money, the largest sports story of our lifetime is occurring. And on Friday... In a 24-hour period, MSNBC, Fox News, and CNN spent a collective less than 20 minutes covering. I'm sorry, that's not the, that's not known day. That's the week of coverage. Uh, for those of you who don't know about this, and I'm disappointed. I'm, I'm sad that I'm sad that no, this is not the national conversation. Larry Nasser is a uh, former now doctor and trainer for both U.S. Olympic. Uh, gymnastics and for Michigan state. And, uh, he has, um, been convicted of not, uh, I believe he's already been convicted of, uh, in sentence for the child pornography, but now, um, the much larger issue of his abuse of over 350 women, girls put into his care over 30 years and the glaring and growing evidence that, it wasn't one or two people who knew it was an entire system designed to protect it, protect him because lo and behold, he was the architect of how they would investigate such things. Um, there aren't, I don't know how much of this you followed. Ali Reisman gave testimony during sentencing on Friday and I'm not going to read it here. And I, cause I couldn't get through it watching it. I, These women have been failed at every turn. No, you're 100 percent correct. I mean, for the for the system to design to benefit this freaking monster, as opposed to the athletes that uh, are supposed to be representing this American ideal, that quite frankly here has been bastardized beyond any recognition. I mean, it's just absolutely sickening and disgusting that that this is even something that we're having to talk about right now because it was actually allowed to happen. And it's just goes to show you sometimes that we get in sports, we get so trapped in this being the best mentality or winning at all costs that 
we lose sight sight of actually matters. And and, in this instance, this is something where anybody that would have anything to do with helping this guy or covering up what happened here, I mean, it's it's it, it reeks of Penn State and what happened there it's just such a horrible horrible representation of of what it means to be an athlete and what it means to support athletes and 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 it's just it's really hard to talk about like like you said uh, you know i have followed this a good bit it's not something that we really dive into into my show quite frankly is expected to the the general general public general mass audience you know doesn't want to hear about it and and that's sad like like you alluded to there it's not part of the national discussion and it's just one of these things it's so weird how we work in a in a 24-hour news cycle you know that if it bleeds it leads but if it starts to make you uncomfortable then it's something that just isn't talked about well i think it's even something bigger than that it's more systemic i think you're 100 percent right that the the queasiness of it makes it not be covered but Let's be clear on why it's queasy. Because when the Sandusky thing happened, that led national news. It's 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 it. Football versus gymnastics. Well, 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 that well, 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 first of all, those weren't athletes who were being harmed. These are gymnastics. I think the larger issue is we don't give a shit because largely they're women. As a nation, if this is if it was three hundred boys molested. Over 30 years, it'd be a bigger story. Gymnastics, badminton, curling. No, I think you're right, and, and it's, it, it is that kind, kind of stimic, uh, uh, fair treatment of women that, that sports has often, you know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even, I'm not even like, I'm not even putting the hat on sports. That's society. This is the world. Like this oh, is, but it's also a lot more prevalent in sport than right. other areas. I'll, I'll give you, I'll 100 give you that. And I think that as people learn about this case and learn how egregious things happened, so today on Friday, the MSU board gave a vote of confidence to Lou Anna Simon, the president of Michigan State. Simon is on the record in 2014 as being told a Title IX complaint against Nasser and continued to allow patients see him within MSU gymnastics for two more years. It's hard to speak up. It's easy to say, I hope someone else catches it. It's not my problem. But that's the mentality. Like that's, and, and I know it's a hard conversation. I know it's not a fun one. But this is why I want to have it. Because if we don't talk about it, then guess what? All we're doing is we're sacrificing the next batch of vulnerable people to be discussed in a 20-minute soundbite and then never thought of again. No, you're, you're totally right. And, and for... Not just you know you know for people needing to hear about it, but the vic- the victims need to have their story. story. Amen. You know, we people need to be uncomfortable. That that's such a problem we have as human beings in general that everything always has to be comfortable. And and, and you know we ha- we have you know pop a pill for this, pop a pill for that. You know what I mean? I mean there's just there, there's so much of this. Everybody has to be happy all the time, and and everything needs to be comfortable. But bottom line is things don't change unless you're uncomfortable. And and we've seen this across the years, whether it's you know uh, women's suffrage, whether it's African American suffrage, you know whether it's uh, the civil rights movement. I mean, I mean, things don't happen until it gets thrown into the and until you know the the general population is made uncomfortable. So uh, I think that obviously, like you were talking about with Allie Raisman and, and her testimony, uh, it's it's rough to sit there and watch that. There is it, no it, it, it shook me. I knew it was. I read it before I heard it. Like I knew it was coming, and it still gutted me. Right, and it's just it's just something that I, I still cannot believe that this was a, a... How, as human beings, do certain people know these things are happening and let it... Because, it, and, and, it, it's, it, like I said, like I said, like, because it's much easier, much easier to mm-hmm, lock on to somebody. Exactly, and I also think that... As we have, as we as as we wrap this topic up and try and, and, and try to somehow talk back about other things in sports, um, I think that it's part of the larger conversation we're having about how marginalized women's voices have been and in how many different ways for so long. Because I guarantee there were women who, in some ways, covered for this man because in some way they internalized the the blame or or, or, they, or they, victim, they blame the victims or the, we watch it happen, and that's why. 
You got to be like, and you got to be. And people say, "Oh, I wish we could just not talk about it." I, I do too. Because if we didn't talk about it, if, if if it wasn't happening, then we wouldn't have to talk about it. But it is, so we should until we don't have to anymore because it's not happening. Well, that's it. That's the bottom line. I mean, until everybody is forced to deal with it and forced to look at the a reality of of what happened and 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 really have that finger. In, in society's face where, hey, this could have been your children. You know, that's exactly. the thing. Until people think that it can affect them. Uh, you know, or, they, or, until you tra- or until you train them to, to think outside themselves for their fellow man without having to personalize it. Anyway. <laughs> but that seems, like a, that seems like a much harder, larger shift to turn around. <laughs> you know you're trying to talk to a demographic of people that elected a reality star star president of the country. Right? I, I honestly... Ugh. Let's move I'm on. Just saying, I'm trying, Ugh, that, time, man. that would hurt. You're trying to scale Mount Everest in one day. <laughs> I tell you that you're gonna need a few Sherpas. Shit, give me some dynamite and well, and, some, and, and put it in the best places. I'll blow it down to my level. Um, let's talk about the NBA because, and this is something I, I, I'm pretty happy about. I can watch the NBA completely unconcerned. I'm, I'm here just for jokes, just for games we discussed earlier. I'm kind of going to turn into a fan atheist until August, and I'm just here for the greatness. And the NBA seems determined every night to give me greatness. Whether By it's, the way, I'm here for the thunder. I really want that team to overturn the apple cart. Can you imagine? I want, I'm, I'm 100% Russell Westbrook because of the way that he decided to stay in OKC and take that for himself as opposed to going and joining like a Kevin Durant or you know doing whatever – uh, LeBron continues to do by being GM of whatever team he's on and pulling all the strings and making sure that he gets the Yeah, he- I can prove to you he's not GM in in one sentence. Well, he told y'all last year this team's not built to win to win in the playoffs and everyone told him he was being greedy. He's like, "Well, but he's the one that made him give Tristan Thompson a max contract." Th- who said that? Who said that? He did. He did not. He let's 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 that. let's move on. <sighs> Let's stay talking about things that are fun, like I'm Russell saying, Westbrook. I, I just want to say with Russell Westbrook, I thought really going into the season, if Carmelo would accept that that auxiliary, that third auxiliary guy, then you know maybe they could be doing okay. And it, it seems like he's finally done that. That's the team that I know they're they're not going to beat the Warriors. I I really but that's the team that I would wish could do any something here. And I also, you know, uh, want to start like a GoFundMe account. Can we get Giannis out of Milwaukee, please? No, no. Giannis is gonna Giannis is gonna single handedly save Milwaukee. Oh, no. not just as a basketball town, as a town in general. Oh, no, please. This ends with him reinvesting all of his money and saving Milwaukee from the ground up and turning it into the first fully automated green city. Like I have dreams of Giannis. Because wouldn't, wouldn't you rather that happen in Atlanta? No, the production costs are low. We need to go to a place where it's very low risk, high reward. Milwaukee is ripe. Restart a franchise in Seattle with Giannis. No, they've already got that Amazon money. We need a place <laughs> that needs us. Milwaukee needs us. What about Portland? With- Nike money. I can answer this, sir. I've thought this through. <laughs> well, I was going to say if the Nets were still in Newark, but no. Brooklyn's got white people money now. It's going to be fine. They have Whole Foods. I'm not, I'm not going to Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> well, but no, <laughs> New Jersey could use it. I'm not going to lie. But let's be serious because it's been interesting because I think you're right. The best storylines have been on the court, but the headlines haven't been. The headlines have been players are not sure arguing more. Actually, texts are down. What the refs are doing, and it's gotten to the point of being weird. They're teching up weird people. Like, they're teching up names. Like, you don't tech names. Because that's how the story happens. They want the power, deep. Huh? It's so... But is it... But why? Like, nothing changed. Nothing happened. All of a sudden, they're like, we're going to call fewer texts, but the texts you're going to call, you're going to notice a lot more. Why? I think more than anything that... You know, Adam Silver wants his league to look more regulated. Shit. And- no, I'm, I'm serious. serious. From, from from what you're you're looking, you're looking at, I think he likes the, likes the image that the NBA is starting to create with maybe more of a a bit of a more progressive train of thought, and that might be something on the outside that they're trying to you know exude and portray. But on the inside, you know, he it's it's his way of making of uh, changing the dress code, like uh like as uh, Daniel Stern did. 
David's turn, first of all. Pr- proud Columbia David. alumni. Why no big always, deal. Why, why do I always do that? Daniel Stern is the, the actor from uh, from Home Alone, isn't he? He is. It's very deep cut and great reference. See, I always <laughs> make that mistake. I, I always As make people mistake. are wont to do. <laughs> I just... Brony or, uh, or uh, Dylan McDermott or whatever that old <laughs> I, I think it's weird because, like, the NBA, it's... And it's the most fun when it's a little bit spicy. Like when people, and you always hear the old heads and people who were 90s basketball fans, the game's too soft. And now, like, if a guy looks at each other crossways, you're teching him up and saying they're going to fight. Like, hey, man, like, people, like, it's an athletic event. And you're allowed to be emotional. You're allowed to be exuberant. You're allowed to, have, to, 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 to push another grown man. And I also think that, and I've said this before many times, it's very telling as a society where we, where we think of these sports because certain sports, like football and basketball, if a fight breaks out, it is the worst thing's ever happened. However, there is a built-in penalty for fighting in hockey and in baseball. It's look at all these guys having a great time. It's always very telling about that conversation nationally, and it bugs the hell out of me. And watching these hypocrites like certain uh, L.A. sports writers who will tell you that uh, a base brawl is just guys working out and playing the right way and a basketball argument is the, a disgrace and a black eye in the league. I'm just saying, we see you. Are you calling out Bill Plasky? I am calling out Bill Plasky because <laughs> the motherfucker can't be consistent for, like, like it's just, it's glaring because like, the Clippers were involved and so he had to get on his moral high horse. And I'm like, didn't the Dodgers last year? And I looked it up and I was like, I'll be. Look, unfortunately, I think a lot of uh, reasoning that you're going into here. Is, is, is it's sound, it's solid, it, it, your, your logic is sound, but none of those other sports, like hockey and stuff, like, we haven't had a hockey player jump into the crowd and start wailing on someone yet. That's only because they can't jump. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Come on. <laughs> hockey, like, like, could be something that could get dangerously out of hand because they basically have knives on, on their feet at all times. Like one of those bad boys off, off on a rampage. I'm just, just saying, but uh, I think that when you have something like the Malice in the Palace and the NBA still, quite frankly, recovering from that. Uh, yeah. Which has always been weird to me because I remember where I was at the Malice in the Palace. We were going to play Brown the next day. I was in a crib, shitty hotel in Providence, Rhode Island. And I watched it happen, and everyone blamed the players. I'm like, that man threw a drink at him. Yeah, no, I, I've always been. <laughs> it's always been weird to me. I'm like, wait, how did this get twisted? Like, throw a drink at me and see what happens. 100% percent players <laughs> I in that from, from the beginning. Especially because, dude, dude Ron Artest is, is not a, a logical or no person. Like, you, you flip that switch. And, that's on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And the, the idiot that ran on the court after Jermaine O'Neal, that's still one of my favorite YouTube clips, by the way, is Jermaine O'Neal just cold cocking. That him. man's life got saved by slippery floors. Right. I mean, <laughs> If he didn't slip, that guy that guy is, is probably still eating his food through a straw. <laughs> well, saying, but it, it's all their fault. And the fans of the NBA, I, I think, than any other uh, any other other like, league, have this 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 kind of kind of or whatever. And maybe it's because they're so close to the action. Yeah. A lot of these. Teams. Yeah. Because I was watching a game the other night where uh, a guy got ejected um, because of something like like one of the players like went near him. Uh, out of bounds. I don't remember exactly what happened, but uh, the guy like stood up over him and like yelled at him, and the, and the player looked back and, like, "What the hell is that?" And then like you see security come up and kick the guy out. But like, just fans have such an entitlement in the NBA. Almost, <laughs> it's really strange. And 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 I'll hear the arguments, but I think I think the the logic I the logic I posited feels pretty sound and pretty airtight. Um, all right, so I want to talk about two more NBA stories before we get to the NFL stuff. The NBA is trying to ruin the greatest thing they've stumbled onto. So they're finally moving the NBA All-Star Game format to a pickup game format where the two top vote-getters will be the, essentially the captains. And they'll, LeBron and Steph. Well, you know, a pers- yeah, I guess, yes. And they'll be – I know, I know, I know. But they'll be voting on – then they'll be picking teams. The problem here is the NBA is resolved to do this picking thing behind closed doors, which I'm honestly – Sam, the, the pro wrestling fan of me, hope this is all a work so they can reveal that they have a, a pick'em special, like that they've been keeping under wraps. I'm hoping that they're working. Like understood in this. 
sense. Like when, when, when <laughs> like, I didn't think they would do this behind closed doors. I mean, that's part of the whole experience. That should be what they do on Friday night. It's there's the All Star Weekend. There's like, nothing more pick up basketball than literally picking teams. Well, they're, they're probably doing it because they want the teams to have a chance to practice with each other. It's like. This is the all-star game. Nobody gives a crap. Well, have them practice on Saturday when they're hungover. Pick them on Friday night. Make, it the, make the pick them the highlight event of your skills competition, which is weak. Oh, dude, oh, dude I want our game back in Atlanta so bad. Like you're talking about being hungover the next day. I just want to stay in Atlanta like, all weekend and just party it up all-star weekend style. I've wanted to do that. So <laughs> Hopefully soon, man. Like, I think we're, we're doing the rotation. They love us. The NBA loves us. They love this city. Uh, I think it'll happen sooner than we think. I do think they rotate back because, you know, Turner's here. All the partners are here. Like, we just pulled off the national title game. Well, we sort of pulled off the national title game. The, the, the people entering and exiting the crowd or uh, entering and exiting the stadium wouldn't really. I had I had no trouble getting the stadium. Well, no, I didn't either, but, there, but a lot of people did. Well, that's I, it seems like that's a them problem. Them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's like a them problem. Sh- shouldn't be broke. Anyway, um. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, oh, first of all, yeah. uh, <laughs> I just see you as one of those field level passes. Right? I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so, but like, is this? Do you think they're going to eventually say, "Oh, we'll just pick him in live"? Because this is ridiculous. Like, to rob us of this, just do the old way. Then, like, why? Why even pretend? They picked well, the just... they picked the NFL Pro Bowl on the NFL Network. They made a show of it. Yeah, this whole this whole is kind of weird. Like, why why you feel like that? Is, like I said to open this, it's like. I thought that was understood that this is going to be something that was done on TV. And the fact that they're not doing it, like you said, it's just very unfortunate. It seems like a very big missed opportunity for something that could get a lot of eyeballs on your on your product, TV, even more so than it already does. Come watch us pick teams. Like, what the like, of people you know? Like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, screw it. Uh, I'm so disappointed. <laughs> something I'm not disappointed in. Uh, last night in the blowout loss in the Thunder, LeBron James crossed 30,000 points. And I want to have a very real conversation, and we'll have it at a longer time, at a later time, but I just want to make sure we all recognize that we're watching a movie. That the, the, the more recent Hot Take Society has kind of deaded us to it, but when you step back and think about what's happened for the last 15 years, 15 years, and how this might statistically be his best year ever, like he's getting better, which is terrifying. Yeah, but I'm about to Mike Wilbon you real quick. Uh, he could score a million points, and he's he's not going to pass for him. Why, but but why did you bring up Jordan? No one's talking about Jordan. I'm talking about LeBron James. <laughs> I hate you so much. Like now I'm going to oh. Well, no, that's the problem, and that that's that's why I did this to bring this point up. We get this. Uh, you always have to compare some, someone to someone else, and I and I, I hate it. I'm like, why can't we just enjoy the genius right. of whatever we're watching, whether it be. Whether it be LeBron, whether it be Giannis, whether it be Kobe, whether it be Jordan, why can't we just appreciate them individually? Like it, making a comparison is also ridiculous because it's something you mentioned earlier about the NBA people viewing it soft. I feel like for me, the NBA kind of died a little when they in, in instigated the rules about you can't hand check and stuff anymore. It's like a part of my childhood is seeing Michael Jordan try to defend a guy out on the perimeter and put sticking his hand out on him, man. I mean, that, that, that's just something that I was always used to. So, I mean, uh, just the the chain. We're always having to compare uh, eras. You, you just can't do that. Do that as the rules were different, and because of the way the game is played is different. Yep. But let's talk about let's not talk about anyone else. Let's talk about LeBron James for a split second here, because we're watching one of the best seasons he's ever put together. Like personally, we're watching. Like I, I, I'm I'm amazed every time I watch him play because he does like he'll do two or three things that makes me convinced he can play till he's fifty. Like his ability to see the court. Just throw him out there on the league minimum and say, go go be a point guard for 18 minutes a night for a for a contender. And he could do it. Well, I mean, he's just such an athletic freak. We have never seen a specimen quite like LeBron. And maybe Giannis came, came along in terms of just being that, that genetic freak, a guy that at his size can handle the ball. Kevin Durant falls into this category as well of just guys that are so big yet are able to move so quickly. It just creates such an unfair advantage. I mean, uh, you, when you, t- you talk about those three guys in particular, LeBron, Kevin Durant, and Giannis Antetokounmpo, you're talking the Gronks of the NBA, just guys that are completely impossible to cover in one-on-one scenarios. Yeah, it's it's and it's not. And the, the thing about the, the thing that separates LeBron is he brings that physicality, but then he's the brain. Like it's 
The weight. He's, he's the, yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 the Neo of the NBA. You know? It's so funny to, to listen to players who've played with him. Like, Kyle Korver was like, so when I got there, he said, so where do you like the ball? He says, well, I like it in a certain – he showed him where he likes to catch it on his three. He says, what kind of seams do you like? And he thought LeBron was kidding. He said that every time he gets a pass on the kickout, it's where he wants it, and the seams hit his hands exactly right. He says, it's the craziest thing you've ever seen. No, exactly, and that's the thing. Uh, we see we see the greats of all time. What do they, they all have in common? It's the, 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 the work and dedication and impression they put into it. And – uh, I think I think James is one of those guys that works incredibly hard, and, and and yes, he knows that he is getting up there in age, so he's he's tweaking his game each and every year to to maximize and, and get the most out of his body. It's 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 the guy's a monster, and and I I am glad to say that I'll be able to bounce my kids in my knee and tell and tell them about LeBron James, and that's something pretty cool. And then I've got to see him play live a couple times and things of that nature. And, uh, we're going to move forward, but I do want to say this. I was going to say, put, putting my mask aside, the most and, and, and many nice things as, things as I've had about LeBron James in like a 15-minute period. So you're welcome. <laughs> I do appreciate it. And I want to make sure everyone knows this podcast stands in one thing and one thing only. LeBron passed Jordan a while ago. Anyway, so let's move on to football. Let's move on to football. And, and in the transition, we've got an email. Because if you guys remember, we had a segment rolling through football season. Well, the football season when football quit me, and I had an email from a listener, man, and this is one. This is one of the best. Uh, howdy, D Palm. I hope all is well. I want to apologize in advance for the link to this email, but how many folks can say a high school concussion led to the end of their college athletic career? He then shoots on Georgia for a while, which I that hurt me. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. I'm gonna skip that paragraph. Just know I read it and know that you know. Yeah, I don't want to hear that nonsense. Um, he's Ohio State fan, man, just rubbing it in like, oh, just he was like, I feel for you, but I'm like, wait a second. Anyway, I had long wanted to call into the right time with Bomani Jones about the time football quit me, but I always forgot to call in. So thank you for reminding me that you are taking story about time football quit, folks. Football quit me during two a days the summer before my senior year. I went from I think I could play D three somewhere to I'm gonna stick to wrestling, the much safer sport. I finally moved up to being a starting nose tackle at five nine one ninety. Oh, buddy. The, the three largest linemen on the team are my best friend, six foot two fifty five, Big Mike, six foot two sixty, and Tank, six six three fifteen. Oh, so you was little man. Like that that that's yeah, okay. Our head coaches, we had co head coaches during my time on JV University, <clears throat> had decided a great way to toughen up players would be for every position group to go through position hitting grills of each other. We had gone three and seven and one and nine and two years before. As a lineman, that meant we ended up taking on an angle attacking drill, an all lineman tackling drill, and this was indicative of the quality of my coaches. The runner would sprint down the sideline, and the tackle would come with them from a 45 degree angle. During the drill, I mostly lined up hitting my best friend or Big Mike. Tank would run through the drill and flatten the smaller defensive lineman tasked with tackling him, much to our coach's ire. Eventually, our defensive coach running the drill said, Why are little guys running up against the biggest? So I thought to myself, Well, I ain't that little. <sighs> <laughs> Man, I, I don't know where this guy comes from, but it seems like they need some uh, bigger beef on the D line. I line up in my starting position, break out of my stance, spring towards tank. I'm lower my level, and suddenly everything goes black like a computer that is unexpectedly shut down. Next thing I remember was the sky looked dazzling and a new blazing orange tinge. It looked like that D12 Purple Hills video. Yeah. <laughs> Standing up. Right, right, right. <laughs> It's a deep cut. I love it. Standing up was especially difficult because I had this wonderfully brand new kind of headache where my entire brain hurt. That's not an exaggeration because the underside of my brain hurt. I had front, back, and side-to-side pain. When the trainer got me back to his office, I could only speak slowly like a mortally wounded T-1000, straining out its last words. Trying to tackle... Not sound gangsta gangsta. <laughs> Trying to tackle Tank gave me my first concussion, which included the following symptoms. Had the same headache for six weeks, like I go to sleep, wake up, and my head hurt the same. Couldn't balance on one foot for six weeks. Couldn't answer a question where the days leap backwards from Tuesday. Photophobia for two months. I got our heavyweight wrestling coach mixed up with our strength coach. Um, one is a 330-pound black man. One's a 160-pound white man. For the rest of the year, the wrestling coach asked me, you know, I'm, I'm not that other coach, right? The kicker was I don't remember mixing them up. Damn. Oh, golly, that, 
Football didn't just quit you. Football, <laughs> yo, you got thrown out of the club in football. Football was like, football didn't ask you to leave. Football ejected you. A few weeks after the hit, I asked my best friend and Big Mike what happened because I didn't remember the impact. They said it was the most thorough trucking they'd ever seen in their lives. And Tank's giant thigh caught me in the temple. <laughs> That's always a bad one. Oh. <laughs> Ty Gurley uh, chubby's hit people with that th- that thigh to the temple. I was always like, "That's a rough way to make money, man." I'll tell you what. No doubt. I ended up missing well over half the season, deciding it was better off sticking with wrestling. Yeah. Uh, this concussion led me to having to stop wrestling in college three years later and moving susceptible to five other concussions. I ended up with five. One from Big Tank. One from, yo, know, I got to be right back in and tell some of these stories. Concussion two. Deaf dude punching me in the head when he tried to run a power half. Oh, I get that. Oh, I see that. That's, that's an aggressive power half. That is. Concussion three. Trying to jump and skip two steps instead of catching. And instead, catching my forehead on the ceiling and the back of my head on the final steps. Oh. <laughs> Concussion four, ran into a ceiling pipe in a summer job, felt like I was drunk for three hours. Concussion five, bumped head into a bar while squatting. Concussion six, lightly bumping heads with a teammate during a live session. Started seeing a junior year of college, made worse than my coach. Time had to dra- run a drag offense year, weeks earlier. I'm going to need some of these stories. Uh, sorry for the link to this. I love your work we've done with UD Pod and your appointment listing. Thank you for filling my earbuds with dopeness. I hope you have a good one. Peace. Thank you very much, man. Wow. Yo. I, <laughs> see, I think, I think you know, Randy Orton hunt, hunt head one time playing playing. Sure, like I went in for like a diving header and I missed, and the uh, defender also missed the ball and kicked me square in the head. Mm. And like none of that, or what what happened to me, pales in comparison to what happened to that guy. Yo, that's a lot of bad stuff. Uh, yeah, well, I may have to have you on to tell them some of those stories. That's <laughs> that's you may have inspired a whole other uh, many many little things I'm set up here. I've actually been talking about it. Might have to get it moving a little bit quicker than I thought. Um, we're recording now before the NFL games happen. It's three bad quarterbacks and, Pey- and uh, Tom Brady. Because, I mean, why enjoy football anymore, right? Um, before we get into trying to... Dude, dude, Sackville, man, I'm all on board. Ugh. Portal service, baby. Ugh. Let's talk first about the games that happened, the teams that lost last week. Um, <clears throat> there are reports coming out of Minnesota that Sean Payton was photographed mocking the Viking skull chant before Stefan Diggs' touchdown. Oh, now, I've seen it. I've seen now, it. Now, 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 I will say this. All you white people doing that skull chant reminds me of a clan rally. It makes me very nervous every time I see it. Come on, man. It came from Iceland. That makes me more nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, fuck Sean Payton. Fuck the Saints. <laughs> fuck your paper bags. Um, the way that they lost, uh, I mean, uh, I, no. I, I ordered a shirt. I've got a shirt coming to me very soon. That has it's like the uh, bar stool one with the Falcon scoreboard on it, you know. The, yeah, 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 yeah. It's got Saints. Uh, what was that? Thirty-four to. Tw- oh, I don't even remember what the score was, but it's got the score and it's got ten seconds left, so it's just like that. But it's uh, Minnesota and New Orleans. I cannot wait. I'm, I'm not saying that's the cover image of this episode, but it very well might be. Yeah. <laughs> it very well might be. I've got it on my phone. It's a, it brings me warmth and comfort in the cold winter months that Atlanta's been experiencing. Um. <laughs> Yeah, Sean Payton did that, and people want me to feel bad for the Saints. I don't have it in me as a person to feel bad for the Saints. No. I'm, I, I'm not wired that way. Why would anybody want to feel bad for them? Right, exactly. Uh, other teams that lost last week, the Falcons lost. Allegedly, Sarkeesian staying as the OC. Yeah, that's horrible. It's not horrible. Like, I've seen flashes. Like, I've seen it get better. I understand kind of what happened a lot in the season with the timing-wise due to the lack of me- game. I mean, the Green Bay game was such a great Falcons offensive performance and then never had a performance like that like that like the rest of the season well I, th- I think th- like I, well I think that that was kind of the outlier because a lot of injuries a lot of the offseason stuff prevented the mini camps from happening and that's when you develop your timing and if you watch a lot of the misses a lot of the drops they weren't like big misses or big drops it's a step here a, a, a step there timing off there so I think that a year another year in the system could prove more games like that Green Bay game and that's what I'm going to lean on Hopefully so. Uh, I, th- I think the, the the biggest thing here uh, for the Falcons, though, is that uh, they need to draft uh, number one from UGA to take Tevin Coleman's place. We need to get some back for Tevin Coleman because we can't pay him. We should have traded him, man. You're right. You're right. No, I, I mean, you think he's there? You think he lasts all the way down there? Or did you trade up for him? 
well, they could get him in the first round if they wanted to take him. But he, I mean, he. You think he lasts? Out, you think he gets out of the first round? Sony Michelle will be a second round pick, I assume. Ooh. Unless the Falcons wanted to take him early. I'm gonna tell you right now. I'm gonna tell you right now. I think you're underestimating what he's about doing this combine. I hope so. That's the thing. I'm, I'm, uh, this is pre combine. If he goes out and shows out of the combine, because dude, I love Nick Chubb to death, but Sony Michelle proved one thing to me this season. He is a better overall running back than Nick Chubb is. And I know that a lot of people don't want to hear that, but look, Sonny no. Michelle can do more, can hurt you in more ways. And I, I think that if you put a one, one, two, because that's the thing. Dev- Devontae Freeze is similar to Nick Chubb in the way that he runs. Just yep. in that hole and just violently hitting the hole. So if you put Sonny Michelle and he can do more things, and Sonny Michelle's way better at catching out of that field than Tevin Coleman is. You let Tevin Coleman go, you bring in a Sonny Michelle, I think that could be another thing that could really springboard this foul. Falcons offense. And that's not just me talking as a Georgia homer. That's me seeing him play all of his years here in Athens and see how versatile of a playmaker he is. He's my favorite running back in this draft. Me too. No, I'm like, like I, I, and not just because of familiarity. It's just I think that you're it's right. a mixed bag. It's a grab you do so much. He does everything for you. Exactly. He, he, and, he's, and he's a hell of a blocker, a hell of a route runner. I mean, just everything that he can do, not just to the Falcons, any offense that needs kind of that Jack of all trades running back. As long as you're not employing Sony Michelle as a three down back, yeah, I think I think you're. And that's and that's where I think Nick Chubb's money's going to get made as a three down back. Yeah, no, exactly. And there's nothing wrong with that either. It's just different types of backs, different uh, upsides. Hey, man, so they're trying to put Mike Tomlin on a hot seat, and I know that the reports originally were like Steelers brass, and now it's come down. It's like, well, Steelers minority owners whose names you don't know. So you can't. Reasonably, I think this is he's suffering from uh, uh, SEC syndrome. He lives on the same block as Belichick. Dude, this is a this is an NFL team that has had three head coaches. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, and, and they, they, they just went. They just went thirteen and three. <laughs> like I don't know who's trying to put Mike Tomlin. That is not happening. Fire him. That would be the stupidest thing they could do. I, I could top my head think of twenty teams that would fire their current head coach for Mike Tomlin. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm not saying the Falcons should be on the list. I'm saying let's have the conversation. I don't know. I kind of like DQ. I love DQ, but I'm saying we should. If, if Mike Tomlin's free, we should have a meeting. <laughs> well, I mean, hey, maybe don't good. maybe don't pull any. Ch- Georgia made the move on Rick because they had to go out and get Kirby. Yeah, they didn't want South look, Carolina to I'm just saying, maybe you don't pull any triggers, but you have to ask, you have to at least have a conference call. Yeah, you know, just just throw the possibility out. Just there. say, hey, Mike Tomlin's out there. Huh, huh. I'll <laughs> this, if Mike Tomlin should be, co- uh, if two coaches should ever switch places, uh, Dan Quinn, Quinn looks way more like the coach of coach. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can you imagine Mike Tomlin? Falcons. No, I can't. I didn't. I didn't know I wanted that until right now. Oh God! Someone bring me a black Falcons head coach, please. Any day. And we're just. It's not. not oh. the most Pittsburgh looking son of a bitch I've ever seen in my life. God, that's a perfect description of both those men. Um, so I'm gonna give us both a chance to be super wrong because we're recording at I think like what's at 120, and the games haven't been kicked off yet. Early game, Pats, Jacksonville, who do you have? Uh, I've wanted to buy into this whole Tom Brady hurt his hand thing, but, I mean, it's the Patriots. They're throwing smoke screens out at you. Yep. So you can't expect anything different. So I, I think I think that the Patriots win. I think the Patriots are going to win the Super Bowl because they don't really have any. Yeah, who's going to stop them? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And plus, here's the thing about the, the Jaguars. If they cheat Ramsey over to try to help cover Gronk down the field, then Chris Hogan and Brandon Cooks are going to kill you. So, uh, you know, I, I just I just don't see a way for Jacksonville to win this. I, don't, it, I will say this. Jacksonville gets so much pressure on opposing teams with the, only their yep. front four. That's the and thing. That is how you beat Tom Brady. Because if you can only rush four and still get pressure and get in Brady's face, you have more guys back there to help out in coverage. That is how you beat Tom Brady, and that's going to be the big key for Jacksonville if they can't have any chance of winning this game. I, I unfortunately don't think they'll be able to do it enough. I, I think it's going to be a tight game. I, I don't see Jacksonville really being able to score in New England like they were uh, against Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh just played a complete crap game. I, I don't really even know how to explain what happened there in terms of a lot. La- well, I do. Leonard Fournette crushed them. <laughs> but I, I don't see 
I don't see Fournette having as much running room because if anybody's going to try and shut him down and make Blake Bortles beat them, it's Bill Belichick, and he's going to find a way to do that. So I don't think you're going to get enough Leonard Fournette, and I think Tom Brady's going to get in those you know, two or three opportunities to put the dagger in and, and show why he's Tom Brady. So I, I think the Patriots are going to win, but I, I don't think it's going to be a high-scoring game. Leonard Fournette, you're right. He, he uh, um, a lot. Belichick is the guy who's able, you say, hopefully to, to to figure out how to stop him. A lot of people have tried at a lot of levels of football. South Leonard Fournette. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's it is a it is a it is a tall order. We'll see how it goes. I think I think you're right. I thought he was crazy, by the way, when he came into the NFL and he was doing training camps and stuff. And like somebody asked him like how how it's been, and he's like, well, it was a lot harder in the SEC than this. Maybe he was right. He, he he's on the something. Um, well, it's also because I guess the players around him are better too. Like I guess maybe it could get easier for a guy like that who's that talented. Don't tell this to the Cleveland Browns, but when you're drafting up near the top of the draft for as many consecutive years as the Jags have, you're bound to get good eventually. You're just trying to hurt Browns fans now. How dare mm-hmm. you? Um, all right, so I'm with you. I think the Pats win it. Other game, Minnesota Eagles. I, look, oh, <laughs> yeah, like uh, I guess. Case the happiest looking football game I assume that I'll ever watch. I mean, just two. Sorry, my mic dropped out there. You're good. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is going to be a very just like, you know, iron meets meets on tight game where you have uh, uh, two really good defenses and two offenses that you really just don't care to watch. Uh, I don't know, man. I, I want to go with the home field, especially because apparently all these Eagles fans are going to be wearing dog masks that you can't even see through. So unless they cut like eye holes in them, it's just going to look really weird. Like something out of like, uh, you know, the twilight zone or something. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I don't, I watched the, the Eagles uh, beat the Falcons last week and I still don't know anything about the Eagles <laughs> so, uh, other than the fact that they have a good defense. So, uh, Very good I'm defense. Just, I'm just just going to because I th- I think be a better storyline. I'm going to hope that it's Minnesota just because then you'd at least have the the team playing in their home stadium for the Super Bowl versus the Evil Empire. So. 100. percent I, I I guess I'll take Minnesota too. I just honestly I'm like whatever. It's 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 been hard for me to be excited for these games. I'm honestly on the fence. I have another show to record. Like, why is the Jacksonville New England game first? I couldn't believe it. It's clearly, the better game. That's the one that needs to be on in like prime time. Well, maybe they don't want me to watch the second one, and maybe I won't. <laughs> um, next coming up tomorrow night, actually, we got WWE's Raw 25. They're uh, celebrating 25 years of Monday Night Raw. Uh, I'm not going to have you speculate kind of what's going to happen. I think a lot of excitement's kind of in the not knowing. There is a um, there's someone I think might be coming back who I I don't know anything about, but I, I got my fingers crossed for. Is there any particular moment that you're hoping happens on Monday night? You know, I think they've probably got something pretty big planned. I don't necessarily know what that would be, but I, I really – I don't know, man. I, I really think that the way that the, the, the company's been going right now, they, they've had some issues uh, with some injuries and things like that mm-hmm. uh, and, and being not being able to capitalize on, on big pushes that they're trying to give guys. So I don't know, man. man. It, they're in a really weird spot right now. So I, I hope something happens. Uh, just right now, the, the main roster is, is, is in a flux. You know, there's, there's, I don't know, it just hasn't been as intriguing to watch storyline-wise for me recently. I'll tell you what, there's two things I think happened on Monday Night Raw 25. One of them involves setting up Taker Cena for Mania, which is going to be a hell of a match. Well, if Taker can, you know. Oh, oh no, apparently Taker looks great. He had that hip surgery in July. So, but, but, I mean, that's the thing. If he does come back for one more, because he's looked pretty bad in WrestleMania. Oh, yeah. But I, I feel I feel like this is him saying, I can't go out like that. Because he's looked uh, very awful. <laughs> very that's awful. Right, Wyatt might have been, like, the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. And uh, my, my other fingers crossed, probably not going to happen thing for tomorrow night, CM Punk. No. Strike, no. strike while the iron is hottest. Everyone always comes back. They put him number two at the top 25 raw moments that they ran on the network and on USA TV. They let his pipe bomb be number two. Oh, it was voted by the fans. Okay, yeah, it's a work, it's a work company, guys. <laughs> <laughs> number two. Yeah, people think that they actually, when, when they do those things like uh, the raw roulette or the, 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 the when they had the, the fans text in to vote, vote kind of match. Actually, crazy. apparently that, that was true. I listened to Edge and Christian last week, and Edge said that if they'd have voted for him, he was going over going to win 
the title from Triple H, but they voted for Sean. It was one of those like Cyber Sundays, and they voted for Sean by two percent. So they had a DQ match. <laughs> That's crazy. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I had no idea. But yeah, apparently I, I, that's, that's one of those things that happened. That's nuts. <laughs> or at least maybe he's working us on the podcast. God only knows. Uh, I, I think that's probably uh, for anyone who's a fan of the, the Squared Circle, we were doing a Rumble Pod this week. I got to get it organized today, but the a pre Royal Rumble Pod will be coming out. I'm not. I'm famously not a huge fan of the Royal Rumble match, and this yeah, year, yeah, we had this discussion before. Yeah. And this year, they're giving us two, so that's going to be a very interesting preview. Um, Sam, do you have anything you want to say to the fans before we get out of here? Not really, other than uh, you know, just uh, like we said, remember to. Uh... Uh, to just kind of think about things outside of sport sometimes because sport isn't the only thing that matters. And unfortunately, some people don't realize that, and it causes a lot of very horrible things to happen. Any system that tells you we're going to protect the program system or team is doing something wrong. You should know that. That should be a pretty good uh, tell in 2018. Uh, before we get out of here, I do want to close on a serious note. Uh, this week, a young man uh, took his life. Um, this young man was a quarterback at a very well-regarded school. Uh, he was 21 years old, and uh, he didn't come to practice. And he was found in his dorm room next to a rifle uh, with a suicide net. And uh, was at Washington State, and it's it's Tyler Helsinki. And stories like this always hit home for me because, uh, as I've mentioned on the podcast before, I, I was playing – uh, at Columbia, when a couple of our opponents, one of our opponents, a uh, player at UPenn, took his life a week before our game, and we played that game, and I've had teammates, I've lost teammates to this this um, scourge, and I want to just tell everyone, like, if you're having these thoughts, or, or, there's someone always listen, there's someone always to listen, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is uh, 1-800-273-8255, it's 24 hours every day. There's always someone to listen. There's always someone who cares. It it, it will always get better. Um, and lastly, we f- please don't be afraid to ask for help. I know we can all feel lonely at times, but no, you're not truly alone. And and, and there's someone out there who cares. And oh man, it's just it's it's one of those things that it it, it doesn't get uh, covered a lot in sports because it's like we said, it's one of those things that makes us uncomfortable. But there's a lot of pressure on these kids. And there's a lot of trauma they go through emotionally, physically, on the field of play in preparation for it. And we need to keep all that in mind um, when we're not just talking about them, but when we're cheering people on, when we're people in our own lives, people that we know, people that uh, are, are local to us. Think about these people outside of what they do on a quarter or field or, 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 or what they could be for your uh, recruitment efforts. These are people behind these helmets, behind these uh, bats, behind uh, running up and down these courts. And that's just kind of, it's not going to get covered a lot. He's a starting quarterback at a Pac-12 school who killed himself before spring practice. And it's not getting mentioned. They show you Ryan Chazier on the sideline. No one says the P word when talking about him. No one wants to talk about Women getting molested and the blind eyes taken. Not just bet, not just the Olympics, where they had a ranch where they were sin kids that they shut down symbolically this week while there were still children at that place at that time. If there were news crews there, we would know that, but there weren't because when things make us uncomfortable, we don't look. We've got to look, or there'll be more stories like this, and you'll have to hear me do the somber voice. And you carry on with your day. These things thrive in silence. If it can be destroyed by light, bring it to the light. That was your show. This is your outro. See you guys next week.